inner recesses of my soul. And I really just want to bring it up this morning. I think it will do us good. We've got wonderful things lined up for the weeks that lie ahead down here. Format will change slightly, but uh, all the same, it's all good. But this is the message that uh, um, has just been resonating in my spirit. And I've given it a title. It's called Get a Grip on Life. Amen. And I truly Amen. and sincerely hope and pray it resonates with each and every one of us. Get a grip on life. You've heard people in a family environment or perhaps an office environment having a nice fit or, you know, workers that are just throwing it all out there. And you all come together and one reasonable person says, hey, listen, get a grip on it. Mm. Well, this yeah. is what it's about. Get a grip on life. Because it seems like life is just fading away or running away from us. Get a grip is what we will tell someone when we want them to gain control of the situation or the circumstances around them. Sometimes it's your attitude that may be going all right or self. Sometimes it's your habits. It could be your spending habits. It could be just some aspect of your life. Or maybe it's life in general. I don't know. Um, but if you are facing a situation that seems bigger than a mountain, uh, the what ifs, do the what ifs bother you? Are they getting too big in your life? Are you facing things in the future that you're saying, what if? And you, you have faith, you are praying, but the what ifs are gaining momentum in your life. What if this happens? Oh, okay, we know so, so and so promised us that. We've prayed, we believe in God for that. But what if? And if you allow it, the what ifs actually can grow in life, and that also can get Amen. the better of you. So it's about bringing things under control, getting the grip as such. Or has life dealt you a powerful blow, causing you to become emotionally unstable and lose your footing from once, from what was once a solid state? So that's basically the message in a, nut, in a nutshell. But let me give you now a little bit of providence. Where did this message start? Like I said, it's been resonating in my spirit for a couple of months now. Let me share this illustration with you. A couple of months ago, someone came to us and said, here's someone here, take them to the airport. They need to go to the airport. So, okay, not a problem. We know where all our time is. They haven't moved. Yeah, we can do that. But it was, you know, um, Albert Einstein always likes to ask questions. He doesn't just do things. So Albert Einstein asked why. <laughs> So the people said, well, this is going wrong in my life and that's going wrong. And I can't do this and I can't do that. And I can't do this and I can't do that. And so basically I sat back and I realized this is something that's happening in a lot of people's lives. We are unable to fix or cope with our own problems. We're becoming good at passing things down. Mm. Now, what was once your problem becomes someone else's problem. Mm. And then that, pro that person takes the problem and they pass it on. So it's like this to use an illustration. We have Annie that's going down to Durban. So I come to her and I say, Annie, I've got this little package. Please do me a favor. When you get to Durban, I will call the person for whom this parcel is intended and they'll come around and pick it up. Okay, no problem. In the car, parcel's in the boot and off you go. <clears throat> you reach Harry Smith. Something happens, you stop, you have a, a break, you're enjoying a cup of tea, phone goes off or something happens you can't make the trip to Durban anymore. You've got to turn around and come back because, you know, there's some life-threatening thing that's going on or company-threatening thing that's going on going on back in Johannesburg. You've got to make the trip all the way back. But so happens, you know, Genevieve's in the area. So you hand the parcel to her because she's going down to Durban. Like a whole nice, all in order. Off she goes. She reaches escort. Gets the news someone's in a hospital in Ladysmith. Now she's detoured. Off she goes with the parcel in the boot. After a while, she realizes, I can't take this parcel down. She's gonna find someone else to take the parcel. So a week later, the parcel eventually reaches Durban. The moral of the story is this, people are not coping with life. We are becoming good at just passing things down. Mm. Oh, I can't handle this. Can you make it your problem now? Can't take care of this. Can you take care of this? It's about getting a grip on life. And if we don't come to that realization, eventually life's going to get the better of us. You're not doing life anymore. Life's doing you. And that's what we've got to be careful of. We've got to do life, not yes. life to us. In the beginning, God said, I put before you life and death. And what did he say? Choose. He didn't say to life. 
choose a person mm. and have mm. the better of them. He said, you choose life because he called you to be the head, not the tail, mm. to be yes. above, not beneath. So Amen. you are to do life and not the other way around, life Amen. doing you. Amen. And so that is, that is what it's about. God wants us to be the head. He said, I will make you the head mm. and not the tail. Mm. Life can't just be whipping us around like yes. that. We like the tail, you know, we're just responding you know, like knee-jerk reaction to whatever life's doing, bringing in, and, and, and throwing our way. So, I like the example of the um, rodeo cowboys. So, rodeo cowboys have got to get out there, and they get onto this bull, and then when they're ready, that gate goes up, and this fierce bull just goes charging into this open arena. And it's stomping the ground and it's jumping and it's bucking and you know the normal motions and actions of, ro of cowboy, rodeo and the bulls and what they do. The cowboy has got to hold on, feet in the stirrup, hands on the reins and he's got to hold on for just eight seconds. I don't know if you know this, but when you're watching it, it looks like it's taking forever. Mm -hmm. But it's only eight seconds, and if he gets thrown off, he's disqualified. Got to re-enter the whole competition until he can do it for eight seconds. That's all it requires, eight seconds. But that eight seconds is so long, it's the, the equivalent to some of us living 30 years of this life. Mm -hmm. Going through this, going through that. And, but anyway, here's the point. I like this example because life is like that. It doesn't want us to sit perch comfortably like we are on its back. Mm -hmm. It threatens to throw us off all the time. It's threatening to throw us off all the time. And so we mustn't be too concerned about that. What we need to focus on is to stay put. You're supposed to ride the bull, not let the bull ride you, regardless of how strong it is. That's what God's called us to do when he said, you'll be the head, not the tail. In the beginning, God created us and created us in his image. And he said, rule. He said, dominate and have dominion. And that's over life. Amen. And that's, that command still stands. And so I always say and that mercifully with this rodeo whole thing, there's clowns nearby. So mm -hmm. when it gets too much, the clowns distract the bull. God's got his clowns. The angels are on standby when things become too much. Now, I don't mean to relegate our beautiful cherub-looking angels to, to clowns. But they're on standby if you catch my drift, okay? If that's all right by you. And then normally I say, when we're watching this, I always say, if a cowboy loses his hat, it's normally an indication He's going to follow his head eventually. It's just an indication. But if he keeps his hat on for the duration, then it's a good sign he's going to last the eight seconds. And the point is this. Don't lose your head in the whole thing. Because if you do, it's a sign that you're losing control. Or you're going to lose control of the situation. So don't lose your head. Lose your head and you lose your edge for that matter. And remember, the crowd that attends these functions, they don't go there to look at the bull. Oh, what color is it? How big is it? What does it weigh? How big are the horns? They are there to watch the cowboy. Mm -hmm. They are backing him. They want to see him finish this whole exercise down here. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Mm -hmm. And of recent times, we've begun to appreciate and understand what Paul was alluding to. Alluding to that he's alluding to the saints that have gone on. Your parents that have gone on before you, family members that have gone on before us, they've joined the cloud of witnesses. They are watching this arena called life, and they are watching you, and they are egging you on to finish. And there's days you say, no, I just want to stay under the blankets. No, there's days I just want to quit. I just want to end, end this whole thing. But they're watching you, and they are saying, come on. You don't realize how close you are to the finish line, and they just want to see you finish. So the crowd of witnesses that have surrounded us, the great Pauls and Peters that have gone on before us, are looking on and they're saying, we can do this. Run the race with patience that is set for us. Amen. Amen. Right, you're called to be the head, not the tail. So maybe you can relate to this. Here's a scripture that just comes in now that is so applicable. Um, David, the psalmist says, when I said... My foot is slipping. Your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. Hallelujah. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Psalm 94 verses 18 to 19. Listen, church, when God is dealing with you, he wants you to get a grip on life. Hallelujah. He wants you to get a grip on life. 
He deals with you, not the situation or the circumstances around you. He deals with you. How do we know that? Oftentimes when we go through the storms of life, God doesn't oftentimes calm the storms out there. He calms the storm in your heart yes. and enables you to go through. Yes. That way you get the victory. He gets the glory. Hallelujah. So <clears throat> Elijah reached the point where he wanted to die. The Bible says he sat down under a bush and asked to die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. I don't know who can relate to that. I've had enough, Lord. He prayed. Let me die. I am no better than my ancestors. But we know the story. God will not let him perish. No. <laughs> I can say thank God he doesn't answer all prayers. Mm. <laughs> mm, yes. Amen. Amen. That's the mercy of God. If anything at all. But what did God do? God changed him. Mm. Helped him. Nursed him back to health. Gave him rest. He needed rest. Gave him food. He needed food. Rebuilt his body physically. Until he was emotionally strong and God sent him back into the, the battle, into the fray. So God didn't change the circumstances, changed him. God didn't get a grip on the situation, God got a grip on his man. And through his man, God gets a grip on the situation. And we need to realize that things are not going to change. Don't pray for God to change things. Pray for God to change you to change things. Once you got a grip on it, God can work through you. And that's what God needed with Elijah. And God got there. If you will allow God to change you, work in you, your burden will be lifted and your conflict will eventually be resolved. And we read in the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But as they were rebuilding the walls, the, the men were standing on the scaffoldings and they had to have a trowel in one hand, a tool, and in the other hand they had a sword. So they had to work and fight, work and fight. And that is the story and the picture that I'd like to convey to us today. We've got to do the same. We've got to work and we've got to fend off. We've got to work, do the work of the Lord and fend off. Fend off what? Fend off discouragement. Yes. Fend off those yes. thoughts that say, go and sit under a juniper tree like yes. Elijah and ask God to let you die. Yes. You know, And he's not going to allow that to happen. You're alive for a reason. God wanted you alive yes. in this day and age. Yes. Quitting is not an option. Yes. Long before you were born, he knew he would be here and he needs you for this time and for the situation that you were called to. So quitting is not an option. And so these men on the wall labored towards finishing the assignment and had to fend off the enemy who was trying to distract them. Just because you've given your heart and your service to God doesn't mean to say the devil's going to back off and go away. In fact, if anything at all, he's coming back treble and quadruple with forces and ammunition against you to hinder and stop what God wants to do. So you've got to fight off and be strong in the Lord. And the Lord is looking for men and women who are tenacious in faith, ready to charge and change the world. Listen to this. Are you one of those he is looking for in this day? Then you need to man up and suit up for the battle. And God promises us in his word. He says, I will teach your hands to war so that your arms can bend a bow of bronze. Amen. And God says, I'm bringing restoration and healing into the lives of my people. I am igniting them once again, once again to become flames of fire to this generation. God wants to turn your scars into stars. Amen. Turn your scars into stars. Instead of something that's festering, like a wound that, that is festering, God wants to heal it. That it glows, like sparkles with the jewels of God's healing power in your life. Amen. Amen. And then he turns your wounds into weapons. Amen. The thing that broke you now makes you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The thing that broke you now makes you. The thing that destroyed you now becomes a weapon in your hand against the onslaught of the enemy. Amen. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm bringing things to a close. This last segment, how to get a grip on life. And it's just some thoughts... Again, as I said, it's been going on in my spirit a couple of months now, resonating, and uh, it begins with a decision. Mm. It all starts with a decision. Amen. God came to Elijah under the juniper tree and said to him, no, you're not going to die. But if he didn't make up his mind to say, you know what? I'm going to take the lifeline God is throwing Hallelujah. me today. Yeah. He would have been a goner. Mm. Yeah. Mm. A book of Kings would have stopped in that chapter and commenced with a new man. And always remember this church, I don't mean to intimidate you, God's always got someone else 
The very stones will cry out and worship him. God's always got another man. But he's giving you the benefit of the doubt. Amen. It starts with a decision. Elijah had to grab that decision and say, I'm going to go with God. It starts with that decision. You need to get back onto the bull of life in case you find yourself this morning. I don't know. Maybe you're thrown off. <laughs> you're running around with the clowns trying to get out of life. Mm. Or maybe you're on the side of the bull. The hat has fallen off and you're like, like, can someone get me off? No, you need to get on right, rather than get off. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, but maybe you're on the ball and you're struggling. It all starts with the decision to get back onto the ball. You must first enjoy the revelation or realization that you need to get back onto the saddle. Mm -hmm. You know, Humpty Dumpty is not going to come back together, mm -hmm. you know, but you need to get back onto the saddle. Mm -hmm. Second thing that we need to do, firstly, starts with a decision. Are we all good with that this morning? Yes. We're going to break bread in just a little while. Starts with a decision. The second thing I need to bring into this whole equation is something called, something called the God factor. Have you heard of the God yeah. factor? Yeah. You see, when we forget to factor God in the God factor, we begin to think like mere men. And mere man is limited by what he can do in his own strength. The God factor is depending on God to do the part we cannot do. Amen. That's what the God factor is. Yes. Depending on God to do the part that we cannot do. Talking about doing life, wow. we sometimes think that, you know, and it happens to the best of us. You wake up Monday morning, you look at all the challenges, and you take it all and you close your arms and you say, I've got to do this. And then by Wednesday you realize you're not coping. Mm -hmm. But you've forgotten something very important, mm -hmm. the God factor. What part is mine and what part is his? Yeah. The trouble is we try to do the impossible and we leave the possible for God. He gets no glory out of doing what is humanly possible. He only gets glory out of doing what is the God factor. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So the God factor is realizing his part and you realizing your part. In fact, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He expressed yeah. his dependency on the Father. Mm -hmm. Everything that goes into this life, this is a scripture found in 2 Peter 1 and 3. And it says, everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. The best invitation we have ever received. That's the message translation, by the way. A very, very, very uh, poignant translation. And the third thing this morning is to realize when God's in it. Hallelujah. That is such a powerful thing. It's just a powerful realization to come to in your set of circumstances. Doesn't matter what you're going through, whether it be a doctor's diagnosis, whether it be something that someone has done or said, but it's just realizing when God is in it. Amen. When God is in it, it suddenly changes the complexion of the situation. Mm. When God is in it. Because when God is in it, you are destined to succeed. Hallelujah. You are destined yeah. to overcome. You're going to come out. Hallelujah. doesn't matter how deep the pit that Hallelujah. you are in. When Joseph was placed in the pit, when God is in it. Yes. Whatever situation you're in, when yes. God is in it with you, doesn't matter. The pit will become a palace. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. The tomb becomes a womb. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. When God is in it. Because the tomb receives dead people. The womb gives birth to life. Hallelujah. God turns your tomb into a womb. It's going to expel you over onto the other side. You're going to live nor die when God's in it. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Round about now, let's pray this prayer. Lift your hands and say, Father, oh, I, acknowledge I acknowledge you as my source. You, as my source. you are my glory, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. I give you credit for everything I have achieved. I ask for more divine partnership and participation in my life. I receive the grace to achieve more. Father crown all my efforts with success and I will give you all the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So those three things so far but what's the next one now? The fourth one and um this one is really good. 
when you don't know, God knows. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. When you don't know, God knows. We don't know everything. Mm. Mm. You can get a doctor's report. What's the end result of this? I don't know. Mm. A financial situation, a stressful family situation. Mm. What is the end result of this? I don't know. But the comfort is God knows. Amen. The comfort is God knows. So 2 Chronicles 20 verse 10, this is the story of King Jehoshaphat who was facing a coalition of three powerful armies that just decided we're coming together against one small little nation. And isn't it just so symbolic of life when the enemy comes together with everything and he attacks just one small person and that is you and I. But what we must realize is who we got on our side. Yeah. Who is char in charge of our army. Yeah. Amen. So three powerful nations came against him. In the natural, he's lost this battle. Yeah. He doesn't even have to fight. He's defeated. Whether he lifts a sword or not, it's a done deal. So he prays and he says to God, after everything he says, we don't know what to do, but we are looking to you. Yeah. Our eyes are on you. Yes. When you don't know, it's comforting to know that he knows. You can have confidence in knowing when you don't know. He always does. God's never without an answer. Amen. For any solution, every solution, every problem has God's solution. Hallelujah. He's got a solution for it. And every problem has God's expiry date on it when he says, this has got to end. Yes. Paul eventually came out of prison. Joseph eventually came out of the pit. Eventually came out of prison. Come on now. Yes. Every problem has an expiry date. Hallelujah. I pray Hallelujah. today God's putting some expiry Jesus. dates on some of those problems. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 48, 17. He says, I am God, your God, who teaches you how to live right and well. I show you what to do and where to go. Mm. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Amen. When you don't know, God knows. And then this one, he will teach you how to overcome your past and the adversities of life so that you can have a rich and satisfying life. Sometimes when we fall off the bucking horse, we tend to stay off. And we um, do post-mortem on what led up to us failing and falling. And then we stay there in the mud. We just stay there. We say, all right, now I see. Now I know why I failed. Okay, I deserve this. And I stay there. Someone sent me a little message this week and it said, your past was your classroom. Mm. Now get on with life. Yeah. Don't live in the past. It was your classroom. Mm. Amen. It's time to get on with life. You learned yes. your lessons. Move on. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we serve the God of the second chance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will teach you how to overcome your past. You know, your past can be your prison. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It's a prison with doors that are open. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is walk out. Amen. Mm -hmm. But you choose to sit in there and commiserate. And you think you're doing God a favor by mm -hmm. sitting in your failure and saying, well, now God will have mercy on me. After that, he has forgiven me. Now, look, I'm sitting in the mud. I'm just going to stay here. Mm -hmm. I hope he's happy with me having failed. No, he's saying, get up. You've learned something. Let's move on. Yeah. Let's do something. Amen. Yeah. Glory to God. And the final point, this one. You don't have to worry about the grip. Mm. Why? Because he's got one on you. Hallelujah. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 41 verse 8. Isaiah 41 and 8, he says, don't panic. Sure. He says, I am with you. There's no need to fear for I am sure. your God. Mm. I will give you strength. I will help you. I will hold you steady and keep a firm grip on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will keep a grip on you, provided you allow him now. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to allow him to put that grip on us. Amen. That's it. Amen. You haven't pushed his hand aside circumstantially, but if you still feel God's hand is on your life, just reaffirm that realization this morning and say, Lord, thank you. In light of what I'm going through, I know your hand, your firm hand is on me and it's on my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. We're going to take a moment just to get our hearts ready for communion this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's just uh, pray a bit. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the service. Thank you, Lord, for the word, the message. Thank you, Lord, that we can move forward to get a grip on life. Thank you, Lord.